Thank you for being here today. I'm John Stupar, a member of the committee uh, of What Matters to Me and Why, and I have the privilege today of introducing our speaker. And, uh, but before I jump into that, I just want to thank those of you who sent me your kind wishes for a, a quick recovery after my stroke in June. And I, you know, it was sudden and unexpected, but according to my neurologist, I'm doing a lot better than expected. So uh, hopefully I'll be back in the classroom, you know, shortly. So uh, thank you. So, you know, by the grace of God. <laughs> but uh, uh, for our speaker introduction, even though we both teach in the School of Engineering, I've only just met her last month when I interviewed her for being our speaker. And she's truly a, a remarkable lady. Very, very interesting. And uh, she's surely going to captivate us with her truly unique and fascinating story. It's, it's certainly, it really is so exciting. We're going to go from the world of communism to earthquakes. <laughs> so it's, it's incredible. Dr. Ann Lemnitzer is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at UCI. And she was born and raised in Germany and completed her undergraduate education in structural engineering at the University of Applied Sciences in Leipzig, Germany. She continued her graduate education here as a Fulbright Scholar over at uh, uh, UC at uh, Cal State Long Beach, right? Yeah. Cal State Long Beach, where she earned a master's in uh, geotechnical engineering. And then she went on to our uh, beloved sister school, UCLA, where she earned a master's and a PhD in structural and earthquake engineering. And she conducted her PhD research on the seismic performance of bridge foundation systems. In 2011, Anne joined us here at UCI, where she manages and teaches the geotechnical curriculum at the, both the undergraduate and the graduate levels. Uh, she also supervises an active group of students conducting research in geotechnical and structural earthquake engineering. Her research interests are in the framework of geostructural response mechanisms of elements residing at the soil to structure interface. She conducts small and large scale experiments, numerical simulations, and collects case history observations to study the behavior of an interaction of super and substructural systems and those elements during hazardous events, such as earthquakes. So like whenever there's an earthquake in, in the world and gets on a plane goes over there, and checks out their bridges and stuff, right? <laughs> Among her many professional involvements and interests, Anne also serves as the editor in, in chief of the Deep Foundations Journal and is a chair of the American Society of Civil Engineering Earth Retaining Structures Committee. So without further introduction, let's give a warm ant eater welcome to Dr. Anne Lemnitzer. With this long introduction, I don't need to speak anymore. <laughs> I feel like, all right, but I'm going to jump right in. As um, John said correctly, I am from Germany. And I'm going to start with a little history lesson for you, just in case some of you forgot, even though I think a lot of you might have actually witnessed that. Um, on the very left photo here, we see um, a figure of Germany in World War II. And I had two grand. Both of my grandparents lived, and one of them fought in World War II. Actually, one of them was right here on the, on the, uh, the Russian front. After he got injured, he had to serve as a cook until the end of the war. And after the war was over, they both um, went back to Saxony, which is the state that I still live in. Okay? And so in, in between 45, 1945 and 1947, then Germany was divided. Right? We lost the war. Um, and um, it was divided in those occupational zones. And on the top left, that was the British zone. On the bottom right, in the southeast, it was the United States occupied zone. And on the west, this zone was occupied by France. 
And the one on the north um, east right here, that was the Russian zone, okay? And pretty much the little town that you see right here, it's called Hattenstein, and it's the town that I grew in. And shortly after the war, there was the Marshall Plan, and the Marshall Plan was a U.S. investment into Germany to rebuild the country. And all of these Western states basically took advantage of it. They got food, medicine, supplies, diesel, gas, all of that. And it started an economic uplift. But the Russians refused to take any help. And they didn't want to have any involvement from the West. So people that lived in East Germany, they started moving towards the West where the ec economy was going back up and the country was rebuilt. So losing a lot of people, Russia decided to start building the border wall. In 1953, right, there was this huge uprise that was put down with the army, the Soviet army, and in light speed the wall came up, barbed wire was put on top, electrical fences were set up, and, uh, and East Germany was there a separate state, right? And soon thereafter, what was being taught at school and everywhere else in the companies, and that's what I had too as a child, was um, pretty much the communist ideology. So every citizen had to become a member of the Communist Party. Only people that were Christians were not part of the Communist Party, but in most cases, everyone was. You had that subject in school, um, you had that in your company once per month. Imagine you would have to attend a meeting and you get a two-hour lecture per month on how great communism is and how wonderful your big Russian brother is. So that's what, what I grew up with. And then starting in 1960, everyone was pretty much depossessed there. I'm not sure if that's the right word. It's when the government takes your land away and everything is made equal, right? So you could only keep small businesses if you had less than three or four people, but everyone else lost their property, and it was managed by the government and organized. So every industry, every manufacturing, every agriculture, it was organized by the government. It was equalized. Everyone had work, even if you did the dumbest job there is out there. It was advertised as a huge contribution to socialism. There was no unemployment. Something like a social security office, that, that didn't exist. You know, no one needed unemployment money. And um, childcare was organized by the government and everyone had access to the same thing. It wasn't necessarily like poor or starving, it was just a whole different level, right? So with this, you see here a few photos of where the wall was built, like right here. That was in Berlin. I'm not sure if you can see this right or if we should turn down the lights just for a little bit, just so you see it. Let me see. Can you still see that? Can you, is this still okay with the video or no? Yes? Okay, yeah. So this is when the wall was built in Berlin and this is how it later on looked like. For those of you that managed to visit East West Germany, um, so there were pretty much two separations, the wall and then there was those barricades in between. There were typically mines on the ground, so the people that try to escape would step on a mine, it would explode, they would be so injured that they would get stuck there, and no one would want to dare to go in there and rescue them. That was, it was normal. Here you see um, the border, it's another part of, of um, East and West Germany right here with that little space in between. And this is how the border looked in a rural area. So that's what I could see near my hometown. And there were those watchtowers. And you come close and you try to cross the border, you're pretty much being shot. So, because we wanted to avoid people um, fleeing out of the country. So, where, how did I grow up? Um, I was born in 1981, so communism was still in in place, this is Germany, how it looks right now. And this is my little hometown, Hattenstein, right here. Okay, I made that store so much bigger, but don't get fooled. It only had 2,000 people at the time, okay? It is an hour from Dresden, an hour from Leipzig, okay? And I grew up in a, in a strong Christian household. My parents were both believers. That's why we were not part of the Communist Party and I was never put in the, in the youth version of the Communist Party. The youth version you can imagine like something like the Hitler Youth. It was organized with activities, but you were always taught an ideology. And so in that case, it was um, communism, 
uh, earlier in our country, it was a different one, right? My dad wasn't, is my, both of my parents are engineers. My dad is a civil engineer. My mom is a mechanical. My mom did not study. She wasn't allowed to go for higher education, so she did a professional degree. My dad did get the chance to go to the university because my grandpa bribed the guy in the admi ad administration. And you know, that, that bribing system kind of worked well in East Germany. So he had the chance, he studied civil engineering. Um, I'm the third child to my parents. My parents uh, had two children, and my older sister, she had the Down syndrome, and she died at the age of three. Um, not from the Down syndrome, actually from yellow fever, which, you know, is easily curable now. But back then in East Germany, it was not. And so the, the medicine was not that readily available, and there's a shock of that. Um, my, my brother came like two, three weeks early, and he died from fever as well. So within two weeks, my parents um, lost both of their oldest children. And so I'm number three, and my sister is number four. And I have to say, up to this date, I, I have a lot of respect for my parents, how they you know, let my sister and I go and move far away after losing two children already. Because um, my sister doesn't live that close to our hometown either, and obviously I'm here in the US, like a 12-hour flight away. So. I have a lot of respect for that. Um, but we experienced a really protected and strong childhood. Um, as I said, I grew up in a, in a Christian family. Um, you were allowed to practice religion in East Germany as long as you don't say anything against the government. If you say something against the government or against Russia or against the communist regime, you would go to jail. As long as you don't say anything, you can practice it, but you were watched and supervised all the time. I'm going to come to our own family Stasi files later on. I'm going to show you a few photos from how it looked like. This is um, later on in like the 70s, 80s, you were actually allowed to build a house. So this is the house my parents built and that I grew up in. So my dad built that by hand. And then this is a and my uncle and my grandpa, they are roof makers, so we got really lucky to have that in our family. And then this is a little dark, um, but this is the house when it was almost um, you know, closer to be done, and this is my mom and I here. And you could think that you know, this, this is where I laid um, my civil engineering career, but <laughs> I tried a few other career paths first. For instance, I tried to become a professional farmer. <laughs> So uh, this is me. Everyone in East Germany had animals, or well, you call them pets, maybe some of those here. But <laughs> they are half a year later on your dinner plate, and that's just something you get used to as a as a kid because there was no huge food selection in the store. So you grew and animals and everything else yourself, right? And I also tried a career um, in bobsledding because East Germany did win Olympic medals in that. That didn't go so well. Or um, then once I could talk a little better, I thought I could become a receptionist. But um, the phone was bigger than my head and that uh, caused some challenges. My last try was to um, become a gymnast. You can see I can hold the balance really well. Okay. <laughs> So this was in front of our house with my grandpa and my dad on the right hand side and my sister was just born here. And it is a sister even though in this picture it looks like a brother. Um, but she is a really gorgeous woman right now and I love her very much. And you, you, might, see, you might see our pant fashion style in these photos and also in the past photos. It's a very um, you know, uniform, but um, I believe I was the Coco Chanel version of East Germany. So <laughs> that's what we're going to stick with. Um, so, um, so my life was actually not that bad growing up in East Germany as a child. Yes, there was some discrimination in school. We were not part of the Communist Party. So whenever something like this here happened, right? On May 1st, we had to go and we had to parade outside. Um, I was not allowed to wear the uniform of the pioneers that was the organization. So I had one more classmate, him and I always had to sit in the last row. It was the row of shame for the people that did not, um, you know, I don't want to say like bow down, but that did not appreciate um, that ideology 
and and you can see it. It looks very similar. We had we had to walk, um, holding up signs of like Stalin, Lenin, um, uh, Erich Honecker, which was the president of East Germany, or Walter Ulbricht. He was the president of the Communist Party, and that just happened every every year, two to three times a year. Right now, I mean, you might have seen stuff like that from you know previous years in China. In its only true form right now, this is probably still in North Korea, the same thing, right? If you want to see it. You see here, this was East Germany's um, uh, uh, emblem or flag, and then you see all the Russian flags. So how did, um, there was one more thing, and it was an interesting thing afterwards, and it's these guys, okay? The Stasi, for those of you that remember, is called the secret, it was like something like the the uh, state security, the minister for state security, but in, in technicality, it was a surveillance system with a lot of spies. For 50 East Mark, which was a fortune, you could be a spy for the Stasi. The network was so huge that no one knew who spied on each other. Being a Christian in East Germany, you knew you were spied on. Um, on the right-hand side, you see those files and files. My family was able to afterwards look into them and see what was written about us. And sometimes you think the people that you were sitting in church with were your friends while you realize some of them were actually spying for the government. Some of those my parents knew right away. I knew two neighbors that were, so my parents would always say, be careful, don't talk really loud. Don't talk when you go by here, only say hello, be very friendly or so. But that was it. It, it was manageable, right? And so if, if, how many people have seen the movie The Life of Others? A few. It's a pretty good description. So for instance, um, you know, in the movie they show that when people that lived in government housing and they had to do some check, whatever, for the electricity or so, what really happened is people would put little microphones behind those electrical outlets right here and record the conversations. And, and a lot of pastors disappeared this way because they listened to the conversations. That's why you, in the movies you always see people turning on the volume of the music really loud and then they have the conversation. It was exactly because of, of that, right? So that worked really well. Um, um, and these, these are my last slides to East Germany and then it's time to, you know, start a new era. Um, we, we never hungered or anything. There was enough, but it was just enough. I remember this was a line for food, probably for bananas in the city. Something like bananas, oranges, that was not common. I, I remember waiting with my grandma for two to three hours in winter, because Christmas time was orange time in front of the store, and you could get four bananas per family or one kilogram, whatever was the lower. Another rarity is I asked my mom on that what we could get because I kind of forgot except for the, uh, for the oranges. Could get one cauliflower per week when it was available, one cucumber per week, four slices of cheese per family only on Fridays with pre-order. Two bananas per family per month. I think we can survive on that, right? <laughs> um, and so, uh, coffee was a luxury item. If you think you, if you're a heavy coffee drinker, you're going to go prank crap. I did the conversion. It was about 35 US dollars per pound of coffee. You think twice about if you can afford this at Starbucks, right? This was a typical <laughs> uh, shelf in the grocery store. And then, um, if you wanted a car, you waited 20. 20 years, or 10, 15 to 20 years was the wait time for this wonderful model. And it was cardboard too. It's called the Trabant. And there was a little bit of a metal frame, but the rest was cardboard. So if you crash into each other, it could be really bad or really good because it was just cardboard into cardboard, right? And it wouldn't go very fast, but that was the model. And then through a misunderstanding, and that's maybe what most of you has, have witnessed, you know, um, hold on. I forgot this is touch screen. This happened and Germany was reunited, right? And the way it just happened is because someone declared the border open for travel purposes only. 
And once that word got out in East Berlin, so many people had to travel to West Berlin that there were waves going and then it was not stoppable anymore. And then everything was opened and then Gorbachev, the, the president of, the, uh, of Russia, um, declared East Germany as independent. So after that, you know, my hometown now looks very much different. So this is my hometown. We have now 5,000 people, which we're very proud of. And it's this little cute town, you know, in, in the east of Germany. And the town uh, my husband and I are going to be returning to next week, Friday. Um, but that story is for later. So um, Germany was reunited. I went to high school. I uh, gave my prom speech. I was one of those nerdy students that was involved in everything. I graduated and I went uh, to college. Not straight. First, I thought I could do a year as a flight attendant with Lufthansa. Okay. And I was on the phone interview, it was in English, and they asked me, um, what would you do at an emergency in the plane? And at this point, I had never flown in my life before. And I said, what emergency? And they said, well, what if the person dies? And I'm like, who dies in a plane? You know, in Germany, we tell the people to stay alive until the end of the flight, and then, you know. And so I failed that interview. I did not get the Lufthansa job. My dad suggested I go study architecture. And so I went to the university in Leipzig. I did my architecture entrance exam. And you had to draw things to a theme. And um, I was told I am so uncreative that there is no way I can become an architect, I should study civil engineering. <laughs> ta -da! I studied civil engineering. My dad was a civil engineer at the time, so it kind of made sense. And I, I did my undergrad for four years, and then I won a Fulbright scholarship at the end of that. At that time, Fulbright was not very known in Germany. I didn't know that it kind of was prestigious and would open me a lot of doors here, so I'm grateful for that but it was really because someone else invested in me there at the university and helped me rewrite my entire application. And thanks to that, I, I got to the step of the interview and I got it and Fulbright sent me to Cal State Long Beach. And at Cal State Long Beach, I did my master's degree. And it was good, you know, and I, the first um, semester I learned a lot of English. I had to, some catching up to do. And I got A's in all my classes except in geotechnical earthquake engineering. And I got a D. And I went to that graduate advisor's office and the guy told me, what kind of students is Fulbright sending over to the United States? I was like. And he said, you know what? I will give you a B and you get out of here. And so he gave me a B and because the rest of my classes were all straight A's and I just could not manage that class. And ironically, that's the class I do my research in now. That's the field. So he let me go. I went to UCLA. I uh, had two wonderful doctorate advisors. I graduated in three and a half years. And I was tw 27 turning 28. And I was, I was done. And I, I got a faculty job at Cal State Fullerton. And I started there for two years. And 50% of the students was older than me because they were the professionals that came back and did the, the master classes at night. And I was this 28-year-old you know, kid that never had worked in practice. And then there were those people that really knew the design codes and everything. That was a life-threatening two years. But it was a very steep learning curve. And then it, I, at Cal State, it, it was good. I could not do the amount of research that I wanted to do, so I reapplied and I came here to UCI. Um, I'm in the geotech area. I do a lot of soil structure interaction, a lot of seismic design. So as um, John already said, I, we do a lot, we look a lot of those kind of bridge pier foundations. We will build them in a small scale. We test them, we shake them, and we see how they behave under seismic loading, right? And what can we do to improve the design code? We also had a project where we looked at the levees in the Sacramento Delta and did some experiments on that. You know, because it is predicted that when the next earthquake comes on the San, San Andreas and Hayward Fault, that those levees are breaking and settling, and which means that the levee, that the delta is going to be flooded and salt water is going to come in, right? And it's going to flood that entire land up there. 
This is where 45% of your drinking water comes from, which would be canceled out completely. And it, it would take billions and dozens of years to repair something like that. And I also got to test on this wonderful thing right here. It's called a shake table. This one is the e-defense shake table in Japan. And so it pretty much, it pretty much you build structures, et cetera, on top of it, and then you shake it and you observe its performance. Well, why is this important? This crazy map shows all the fault lines here in Southern California. And there are a lot. You never knew on how, on how many faults you actually sit. So if you zoom in a little bit right here, this is Orange County, right? On this side right here, this is the San Andreas Fault, right? This is the, the lower leg of it, the Loma stretch. This is the Elsinore Fault. And then we are somewhere right here, and we still have little faults outside. So you have uh, the Palos Verdes Fault. This one is still active. And then this is the Newport Inglewood Fault. Um, that's not so active. That's, you know, the closest to us, but so we kind of got lucky with that. Okay. Now, after, after with all the seismic activity here and around the world, I get a lot of questions, a lot of questions on, you know, earthquake stuff. And, I mean, this, don't believe anything you see. This is the San Andreas movie, and for those of you that have seen this movie, this movie has a tsunami that flushed the Golden Gate Bridge away. There is no way this could ever happen. Okay, it's, it's not possible, okay? A high tsunami is maybe 20, maximum maybe 30 feet. The Golden Gate Bridge is 217 feet high. So a, a lot of us earthquake engineers got called by like newspapers afterwards when this came out and asked, oh my gosh, is this really gonna happen and what can happen? So I thought we're gonna go through a few earthquake myths you can't use your pet to predict an earthquake, okay? <laughs> this is not working even though some people think, yes, animals do have a sense a few seconds earlier than humans and sense things, but you cannot use this as your you know, early warning system, okay? Um, the next one is weather and time. Also not, if it's really dry for a long time, it does not mean we would have an earthquake. There's also no, no statistic that earthquake always happen in the morning or at night. It's not true if you look at the whole sum of it. Uh, California could fall into the sea because of an earthquake. Actually, that's a lot because people do simulations along the San Andreas Fault and they think if the big one comes, it could split off. It's not possible. If you do the numerical simulations, the San Andreas Fault ruptures, first of all, in this type of mechanism, so it cannot slide off like this, right? This is a different fault mechanism. Um, and the highest magnitude that was predicted a few years ago was around 7.8. Maybe now it's a little bit over 8, but it's definitely not enough, okay? Now, um, the safest place is under a doorway. Also not true. It used to be true for unreinforced adobe buildings. Right now it's not. Most people die and get injured by monitors and stuff flying around in the upper floors. That's what the statistics show. If you were in a building like this, I mean, I would say run as fast as you can. We're close. We can all make it right now. Um, or go underneath a table. Well, I'm like, only I am lucky in that case, okay? <laughs> so sorry for you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, unless you're in a 1960 reinforced concrete building that's not retrofitted, you know, just hide under something um, stiff or rigid. Small earthquake keep big ones from happening. That's also not true because strain accumulates way on the bottom of the fault. Okay, so if you have a few small ones, it's typically not an indicator that a really, really big one is coming. So there's not going to be a tsunami in LA. We don't have a fault outside in the water that would uh, slide in that mechanism to push the water up and trigger a tsunami, right? Our faults here are these type of faults. They can't trigger a tsunami. And magnitude versus distance, I had that, you know, um, sometimes it doesn't really matter how big the earthquake is. It's a function of both, how far away you are and on what type of soil you are. We call that in geotechnical engineering site response analysis or soil structure interaction. So, you know, if you are on a really stiff soil and you have a stiff earthquake and, and it's designed well, it reacts differently than if your house is built on a very soft soil. 
and it requires a little bit more of an analysis than just the generalization, okay? And so, um, well, I guess I can't tell you too much because otherwise we're gonna lose our job, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> with this, I also do earthquake reconnaissance. Here you see a few photos from my last trip to Mexico. Some of them were in some of the magazines at UCI. And every country reacts differently. We were in, I was in Japan before and Chile before. But you know, in Mexico, something that stuck out to me is they had no electricity and water in most parts of that, that got hit by the earthquake. But the people kept smiling as if nothing happened. And they just had such a joy and they just kept living daily lives even though they had to go and travel from far away to get like where a truck came and brought them fresh water supply. And the kids would jump around and they would hose each other down with the fresh water. And we're just looking there and was like, man, I don't think we would see that in the United States, you know. And they just had still so much joy and fun. And it was really, it was really eye-opening for us to, to go there and see that. But other than that, what we typically do is actually look more at the structural integrity of the buildings and lessons learned that, so we can improve our design codes here. So, um, no, that was a too early sneak peek. <laughs> okay, so um, I think I have like 15 minutes left. I'm going to be brave. The last few years, I think I got very fortunate. I um, won two awards from the biggest professional societies here in my field. I got very fortunate. I won the NSF Career Award um, as one of the faculties in engineering. I, I made tenure uh, just a few months ago in July, and I know, huh? Well, there is a story to that. I got, I got um, to chair a conference just last week where we broke the attendance record in our field, and, and I had a good team with whom I put the program together, and we had over 1,000 people there, which was an absolute record. And I just got the invitation to be the youngest keynote speaker at the Geotechnical Pan American Conference. And so I was like, and I have a cool research team too. This is my research student and my husband and I on our wedding. And um, that was a while ago. That was not just right now. That was 2015. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm really blessed. But I actually wanted to share a little bit that it was not all so glorious in this easy path of success straight out of like East Germany and now here to what it is now. And so there are a few things that I put down to what matters to me and why that I just wanted to go through. And um, one of them, or one of the things that I, I think was important to me is work hard. And that's what my parents installed in me from the very, very beginning. Um, I heard a quote that said, motivation is what gets you started, but habit is what keeps you going. And so um, I always had that. I, I had the chance to meet this gentleman the other day. For those of you who don't know who this is, this is Carl Lewis. He won, he won nine gold medals and one silver medal in long jump and, and running. And he said to me, you've got to work in your 20s so you can do what you want in your 50s. So it's pretty good. Unfortunately, now when I look in my classroom, a lot of people think that 30s is the new 20s and then you know, 50s is the new 30s and something like that. And I, I think it's, it's critical to start that hard work early and, and to, to pretty much, um, I mean, I think we all know the word entitlement. I have to say I was lucky enough that in East Germany there was not a lot to be entitled about, so I didn't have to struggle with this that much, but the more luxurious and well our society becomes, I think our kids are going to struggle with this. Um, another one was um, that I tried, I obviously I already showed you the Mexico photos. This is a little PowerPoint <laughs> full paw on my end, okay? okay. Just ignore it. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Research shows actually that people in a normal conversation on average complain one time per minute. It was kind of shocking to me. And you know the major outlet for complaints nowadays is Facebook. And Facebook receives, like public complaints, 879 million per year, every year new. And so it's, 
it, it's re really an underpracticed habit to practice gratitude. And I, I wonder how many of us actually sit down at the, at the end of the day and, and be thankful after visiting those people in Mexico and, and see how still how joyful and thankful they are. It was really eye-opening. Eye and, um, and sometimes I, I ran across this quote and, and sometimes I think, man, I would be left with nothing. It says, what would you do if you woke up tomorrow morning and all you had is what you thank God for yesterday? And I think most of us would be homeless, unemployed, and hungry. Just to start with the simple things, at least in my case, because it's completely under practice, a habit and an attitude of gratitude. Um, another item to me, or what matters to me, is listen more and invest in people. Um, Warren Buffett had a quotation, and of course he refers it to business, but he says, I insist on a lot of time being spent almost every day to just sit and think. Um, that is very uncommon in American business. I read and think. So I do more reading and thinking and make less impulsive decisions than most people. I do it because I like this kind of life. And yes, he does it for business, but how many times are we actually just sitting down and thinking or praying or having quiet time and just spend like some alone time? Um, research shows that this distraction is so much, on average, an average adult spends 135 minutes on social media, Facebook, Twitter per day. Um, uh, statistics also show that at the end of your life, you will have spent five years of your life on social media. That's right now, and it's, that trend is tend to increase. Our current teenagers, some of them average five to seven hours per day on social media. So imagine where that number goes. I have to say, um, Listening and, and actually sitting down and taking time for people has become really rare. And, you know, in my life, when I look back, it was those, those people that, that sat down and listened to my story and spoke truth into my life that, that it, it became the most influential. For instance, I had only one friend and my parents that told me, and you're about to marry the wrong guy. And I was engaged and I was 27, 28 years old. And everyone was afraid, and no one wanted to say anything. And um, I ended, we ended up calling off the wedding. And then we postponed the wedding. I don't know what the heck I was thinking. Um, and then in between, we broke up, and we called off. The second time, we scheduled the wedding. And you know, the, the gentleman was a fine gentleman. It was, it, was just, it was not the right fit for me. But if I would not have had those people that take the time and speak truth into my life, that could have gone down a, a wrong path. And someone, it only takes one person to um, basically change your life, the one there to push you and believe in you. What people also don't know is I was on the verge of being kicked out of UCLA. That PhD that looked so glorious in three and a half years, it was my two PhD advisors that actually invested in me because I failed my candidacy exam twice. And when I took it the third time, it was on the verge again, and they said, you know, we are going to pass you because we see a lot of research potential in you and we believe in you. But by the statistics, it would be a fail. But that would have been the end of my entire academic career, and who knows where, that, where would I would have been right now. So I, that's what I try to do with my research group, and that's why I sometimes apologize, but push the heck out of them to you know, build their resume and send in applications. And I, my husband has to help me correct and edit their applications until 2 a.m. in the morning. But it's that investment. And similarly, um, I work with the Royal Family Kids Camp. It's a, it's a kids for, it's kids camp for foster kids. And you, know, you never know, even though sometimes it's just one of, or two weeks of your life, what impact you make in those people's um, lives. So be that one person. If you have absolutely no idea this is a great book to have, it's a strength finders test. I did it. I actually didn't choose to do it. A guy that wanted to date me made me take the test. Okay? And that's the truth. So, but I'm eternally grateful. Um, this test, actually, you can get your top five strengths. And I, I, I kind of knew it intuitively, but one of my strengths 
you know, is to invest in what is significant. And if you see significance and potential in someone else, to push it and bring it out. And it kind of confirmed it. Try to do the test. You cannot cheat. The questions are so obscure, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be surprised. Um, another one was try, learn, and grow. I, that's, I think we all need to do that, right? Um, continuously to try learning and growing. I, as an assistant professor, thought when I started I needed to have it all together, and this book really helped me to simply enjoy learning versus thinking I always have to prove myself, I always have to be ahead of my PhD students. It's, it's not possible, it's not sustainable. Um, I read a quote that said, if you're applying for a job which you are fully qualified for, you're applying for the wrong job. And it's actually a good practice. Um, this was the hardest for me. Don't resent disappointments and failures. And don't let people tell you it can't be done. Well, calling off two times a wedding wasn't the easiest thing. It was actually really shameful. I was afraid to go back to the church I was in, even though people understood. Um, when I found uh, the gentleman that I married, which is a very nice guy and the ant eater graduate, by the way. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I thought this is going to be really great. And these, these first two year, these years of marriage were really, really difficult. And we struggled. And I thought, man, finally, you know, found the right guy and it's going to work out. And my goodness, I didn't know what kind of a mean person I could be. And he, he was used to being around in a big family. I was not. I lived on my own. And I had such a hard time with the fact that we're now all together 24-7. And he was always there. And I couldn't get rid of him anymore. <laughs> no. Now I don't want to get rid of him anymore. He's sitting right there. And he, I still, he still needs to take me back home, so I need to watch what I say. Um, but, you know, it, it was such a growth experience. And it was super difficult. And the same thing with my tenure. You might think, oh, these awards and everything is crazy. My department manager, Lori, remembers that the first time I had to go up for tenure, you know, I was so frozen that she picked up the phone and she pretty much told me, turn in your stuff. And I just started crying and I couldn't even talk. And I was so afraid because you know what? I didn't have enough stuff together to go up for tenure. I, I had a lot of good stuff. I didn't have enough publications, and people didn't think I would make it. And so one committee member on my tenure committee said, you know, we're going to postpone this to next year. Then everyone can see all your papers, and you give this a try next year. And the engineering school was gracious enough to give me that extension in the campus. And in that year, I won those awards, and I won the career award, and I went up, and it turned everything around. And it was just like, and I, I think that timing is, is, is definitely not coincidence. And a lot of people prayed for me during that time, and I'm eternally thankful for that. And then after we finally got tenure, we thought, now we're going to have a baby. We're going to have a family. And then we found out earlier this, this year that we were diagnosed with 100% infertility. And it's, you know, it's like, OK. And then. Um, we looked into a few options, et cetera, but there was nothing we could do surgery or IVF-wise. It, it, it is what it is. And we had to come to the conclusion that you know, we're, we're not going to have our own children. And um, someone said to me, you know, why do you think, where do you get this expectation from that life is supposed to be easy? Life is not easy. What makes you think that everything is going to fall in place for you? And we, we came to peace with that. And actually, a few weeks later, we realized that while we were being diagnostic, I was already pregnant. Even though medically, <laughs> medically, it is completely impossible. But it's not impossible in, God, in, in God's hands. And um, well, that's why I said, em embrace the disappointments. You never know. You don't grow during success. Um, the very last three items is make no excuses. Um, I'm going to save this. Um, either deliver your best performance, but don't apologize beforehand, or like don't perform at all, OK? But don't make excuses. And then on the other hand, if you're not confident enough, don't apologize for it. 
and I gave a presentation skill workshop last week, and when I did the research, I realized, you know how many women, and I see that in my field in engineering too, there are only very few of us, but um, we start out a presentation with making an excuse or an apology beforehand in case it doesn't go well. And when I look back at the what matters to me and why videos, 60% of the people started out saying this is the hardest talk I have done, which is true. It's much more difficult than a technical talk, but it's that preface that we start with. So I decided if those goes awfully wrong, I'm going to sabotage this camera, and you're the only people that hears it, I'm going to destroy the video. <laughs> but you know, don't make excuses, and especially for us women. We, we're stronger than we think we are. I found this really nice quote. It says, I think women are foolish to pretend they are equal to men. They are far superior and always have been. Whatever you give a woman, she will make greater. If you give her sperm, she will give you a baby. If you give her a house, she will give you a home. If you give her groceries, she will give you a meal. If you give her a smile, she will give you her heart. She multiplies and enlarges what is given to her. So if you give her any crap, <laughs> be ready to receive a ton of, okay? I thought this was really fitting and <laughs> really <laughs> encouraging. Um, as eight is my last point, this, but these go quick. Know where your identity lies. It's so easy for us in this driven academic environment, especially faculty and upcoming PhD students, to define ourselves by our work. But you know what? At the end of the life, no one cares if you wrote another paper or another proposal. It's great, and we should strive for academic excellence, and I fully support that, and it's what's gotten me here. But be careful that this is not the only thing where your identity lies. For me, I can say my identity lies in Christ, but it's really difficult because I'm so prone to like, get all my value and my whatever appreciation out of how many papers I publish and how people perceive me at a conference. And you get sucked in, into this like hamster wheel of thinking. And I, I, I came across a, a referent at our church said that what do you want to be remembered for at the end? And there are a few obituaries that I want to read to you and you could think about it. Um, one, one lady, Mary Ann Nolan, died two years ago and her says, Faced with the prospect of having to vote for either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, Mary Ann Noland of Richmond chose instead to pass into the eternal love of God. <laughs> there was another one that was um, for Harry Stamps, uh, died in March 2013. Harry took fashion cues from no one. His signature everyday look was all his. A plain pocketed t-shirt designed by the fashion house Fruit of the Loom, his black label elastic waist shorts worn above the navel and sold exclusively at the Sam's Club on Highway 49. And then some are very honest. This gentleman wrote his own and thought he needed to set a couple things straight. He said, I have confessions and things I should now say. As it turns out, I am the guy who stole the safe from the Motor View drive-in back in June 1971. I could have left that unsaid, but I wanted to get it off my chest. Also, I'm really not a PhD. What happened was that the day I went to pay off my college student debt at the University of Utah, the girl working there put my receipt into the wrong stack, and two weeks later, a PhD diploma came in the mail. <laughs> I never actually got a bachelor's degree. <laughs> and the last one is somehow painful to hear. This, this family wrote about Leslie Charping, who died in January 30, 2017. Leslie's hobbies included being abusive to his family. With Leslie's passing, he will be missed only for what you never did, or what he never did being a loving husband, father, and good friend. No services will be held. There will be no prayers for eternal peace and no apologies to the family he tortured. I mean, that, I think that puts it together with what do you want to be remembered for? My last point is know where you'll spend eternity. It's going to come. Death is the only thing that is assured to all of us in this room. So if you know where you will spend eternity, you are, you are blessed. And with this, um, I would like to conclude my talk.
and thank you very much for coming. Right, you're welcome. Such, such inspiration. We have time for maybe one or two questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and someone will bring a microphone from the left or the right side. Clear it in the back. It was very, very good talk. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, my question is because you mentioned that there are some animals that sense the earthquake. <laughs> guinea pigs are one of those. <laughs> <laughs> That's why she has guinea pigs. <laughs> and how early warning do those guinea pigs give? Like, I, I'm wondering, do you know that? No. You know, so there is a story in China, and I have no idea if it's true or not, okay? They said that the cats of the town left the town, it was in the, mi in the middle country of China somewhere. And people got so suspicious that the, all the cats left or ran around like crazy and tried to get out. And so the people evacuated the town. And then a day after the earth an earthquake actually happened. So whether someone was attracting these cats outside was something or whether there was really something to it has never been proven, but in general, you no, you cannot really use animals as your early warning system. They cannot predict that. But I can then have a cat instead of guinea pigs. <laughs> you try it with the cat. If you predict the next earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, man, we all want that cat. <laughs> so. All right. So do you have any hobbies, say, <laughs> photography? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> That's funny that you asked that, Shelley. Um, yes, you know, besides failing this architectural exam and being told I'm completely uncreative, I love doing photography on the site. So I have been doing you know, weddings and engagement and maternity shots and all my free time as an assistant professor, but if, if to most of my friends and my students and everyone, I will just do it for free. So if you do have, if you're in need of a photo session, let me know, but you only have 10 days left because Kurt and I are going on a sabbatical uh, a visa, kind of mandated sabbatical next, next week Friday. But we'll be back, so. Okay. All right, thank you, and thanks for coming.